Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. We have just completed one year doing this podcast and a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us and tuning in. The results have been amazing with Indian Genes now officially featuring on the Apple podcast charts as the number one here in India for science and featuring on charts in the US, Australia, Europe and the Gulf as well. So it's been overwhelming. And in this episode, we continue speaking to amazing individuals with our guest today being one such person. It's an absolute honor to have her speak to us today. Uh, she was nominated to the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council for Space Technologies for a period of three consecutive years from 2016 to 2019 and was included in the BBC's list of 100 most influential and inspiring women from around the world for 2019. She is a spaceship designer, serial space entrepreneur and a climate action advocate. She has co-founded India's first space startup Earth to Orbit in 2009 and is the only space entrepreneur in the world to have started companies on three continents, Asia, Europe and North America. She's one of very few people to have visited both the Arctic and the Antarctica. She co-founded Moonfront, an aerospace consulting firm based in San Francisco in 2001 and made her entry into space entrepreneurship with that launch. She has also co-founded Liquifer System Group, an aerospace architecture and design firm in Vienna. She has also served as one of the prominent members of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautic Aerospace conferred with the International Achievement Award for promoting international cooperation. She was included in the elite list of 25 Indians to watch for by the Financial Times magazine and is also featured on the front cover page for Fortune magazine in 2017. We now bring you a very special conversation with a person that continues to inspire us and push boundaries, Dr. Susmita Mohanty. So, hello, Susmita, and a very big welcome to you from everyone here at Indian Genes. Thanks, Joachim. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation. All right, Susmita, we just introduced, uh, introduced you to our audience, and I must say that you've got an absolutely amazing bandwidth of stuff that you've done, and we're going to be trying to talk to you about all of this. But let me start by listening to you, because I guess with all that you've been doing, the least I can do is listen at the moment, so I'll try not to interrupt you. But and if we get back to to where this all started, how would you speak to our listeners and and let them know how this started for you? Um, so I um, I grew up uh, in Ahmedabad in the early seventies and uh, early eighties, uh, and I was I was amongst the people who started India's space program, um, and I also was in the midst of architects, contemporary architects, and patrons of architecture, mostly Cotton Milono families who would invite amazing architects uh, like Corbusier or Louis Kahn, Bivi Doshi. Bivi Doshi got a Pritzker, which is like a Nobel in architecture a couple of years ago, uh, mm. Charles Correa and so on. So if you, if you think about it, these were the times when India had, was uh, a young uh, republic and was trying to come, in, come into its own and architect an identity for itself. So here was science and technology on one end, and there was art, architecture, and design on the other. So I grew up amongst the cultural and intellectual milieu that gave me the opportunity to talk about anything from art to industrial design to space exploration. And I think that's the childhood which shaped me into who I became in later years. Right, and I think at that time, Ahmedabad also was kind of the center for uh, architecture and art. Uh, would that have had some inspiration on in you growing up? Uh, yes, uh, most certainly so. So if you look at the Cotton Melono families, like the Sarabhais and the Lalbhais and the Hathi Singhs, uh, between them, they put together amazing institutes that I could easily access on a bicycle. I mean, back then there were hardly any automobiles on the, on the yeah. road. And within a 
five to eight kilometer radius, I had access to amazing people and amazing libraries, right? So I could go to School of Architecture, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, Space Application Center, National Institute of Design, uh, Textile Research Association, Physical Research Laboratory. So I think uh, having access to such amazing uh, both human capital and also sort of knowledge repositories were the ones which triggered uh, this, uh, what do you call this way of living that I still pursue, where I come up with an idea and then I pursue that idea and make it happen. And your pedigree speaks for itself because I think your father was a very special person at ISRO as well. Would you want to give us a little bit of insight into that and how that actually inspired you in, in this direction? Yes, well, my dad had, uh, so he, he studied uh, in Ravensa College in Katak, and then he came to Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore for his master's. Uh, back in the day, there were no entrance exams. You know, Indian Institute of Science would just invite a couple of students from every state across the country to come and study. Mm. And he was one of 30 or 28 odd students for that year um, for his department. And he then went on to do a fellowship. He was selected for a German fellowship called the Dad Fellowship. And he was in Germany uh, on that fellowship. And he also worked in a radar company for a year. He's a microwave guy, a microwave specialist. He came back to India in uh, 1968 or thereabouts. And Sarabhai was just starting to hire young engineers. Um, and interestingly, Sarabhai's dream team had young people who had not only studied in India, but some of them had also studied abroad, you know, in Caltech and MIT. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a very cosmopolitan bunch of young people who were part of this team. And my dad was one of them. Yes. And you then moved on to uh, studying through your university. And how did and when did you decide that this was going to happen? I, I've been reading some very interesting stories that you've been putting out where you were able to reach out to people and you were very interested from a very early age, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And um, since we just talked about my dad, I should say that on his return journey from Germany, he chose to take the ship uh, as opposed to fly back. And he had this amazing steamer trunk. So it would be a one month long journey through Cape Town, Mombasa, Karachi to Bombay, uh, starting mm -hmm. from Venice. He used to live in Germany, but he took the ship from Venice. So I think one of the interesting anecdotes that I like to share is he had this superb steamer trunk. Uh, think of it of like a four feet by two feet steamer trunk where you bring your belongings, you know, on a ship. And this was like my box for exploration. You know, it had everything from a Feuchtlander binocular to a Grundig tape recorder to a brown shaver to a wooden tennis racket, uh, a slide projector, a, you know, amazing slide collection. So that sort of became the universe where I started exploring, if you ask me. And it also had a portable typewriter. So one of the things I did in high school growing up, not only did I go to these libraries, I would come up with uh, perceived problems of living and working off the planet in outer space. And then mm -hmm. I would try and find design solutions for those problems. Uh, and I had a typewriter where I would type up my projects. Uh, I still have that typewriter, by the way. It's a German typewriter with a German keyboard. So the Z and the Y are sort of exchanged mm -hmm. in, in their locations. And I used to draw by hand then. We didn't have computers. We didn't have email. And I used to write to universities and space agencies around the world where they were working on similar topics. And for every 10 letters I would write, I would, of course, send them bits of my work as well. And I would hear back from at least two or three of these institutes, right? So that uh, is, I think, for most students or most young people growing up today, uh, sending something by snail mail is not something they can imagine as being the coolest thing. But for me, it was very cool Absolutely. you know, to write, to mail it. And sometimes I wouldn't even have proper addresses, Joachim. I would just say, give the name of the person, a designation, the city, and it would reach them. You know, and, yeah. and that's the beauty of mail. And unfortunately, uh, the current generation will never, never quite experience that magic. Uh, so that's how I got started. 
And by the time I was in late high school, I was very clear that I want to become, I used to call it a zero gravity designer back then. Nice. And uh, so there was no clear path that was recommended for someone who wants to design for extraterrestrial environments. So I charted my own path. I worked on these projects which were totally self-motivated, self-initiated. And then I went on to study engineering um, in Ahmedabad. Uh, I, I always tell young people that think of engineering as a foundation for problem solving, for systems thinking. Uh, it doesn't matter really whether you do mechanical engineering or environmental or computer science. Think of it as the nuts and bolts of how your mind starts to evaluate problems and solve them. Mm. Right? Um, then I went on to do industrial design at the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, which in my view is one of the finest design institutes in the world. Uh, it was started in the 60s by Gautam and Gira Sarabhai uh, on recommendation from two very avant-garde designers from California, Charles and Ray Eames, who were invited by Nehru to tour the country. So they were invited to go on a tour of India for six months and come up with recommendations to quote unquote, improve the general quality of things. Wow. And we as a nation, I feel are still struggling to be able to prototype and build things which are top notch, right? And mm. so NID was created for that purpose. So industrial design, communication design, uh, and I, I chose to go to NID and study industrial design. So to me, a combination of engineering and design, in my mind, was essential to look at any design problem that involved humans and human exploration of outer space. So that's how I chose my first two directions when it came to uh, pursuing a formal education. And then I went to the International Space University in Strasbourg in France, and that was not so much uh, Rockham for another master's. It was the reason I went there was because I wanted to become part of the international community or family of young people who are crazy about space. <laughs> and after that, uh, eventually I did a PhD from Sweden. Again, a very organic approach to the PhD. Uh, I happened to be in California working for Boeing uh, for the space station program. And a French friend of mine who was at NASA Johnson as part of the French company Aerospatial working on uh, what was called the crew return vehicle or the CRV. He just called me up one day and said, Susmita, you know, a bunch of Swedish students are here and they have a design studio where they're looking at designing for living in outer space. So why don't you fly down and meet them? So he just sent me a ticket. I mean, I didn't even have to buy my ticket. And I, <laughs> I flew down and I met a Swedish professor who we became friends and she was very keen on having me as a PhD candidate. And I said, okay, well, I'm living in San Francisco. After that, I moved to San Francisco and I said, I'm living mm -hmm. here and you want me to do a PhD in Sweden. I mean, we can do it as long as you're willing to make some exceptions. And she did. So I did a PhD in uh, aerospace architecture, which is an invented discipline. Um, so that's sort of the trajectory my uh, education has kind of meandered through. I think the next you you also co-founded Moonfront in in two thousand and one. Yes, Did you want yes, to just tell yes. us a little bit about Moonfront and what exactly you all did? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, so I I did to start with. I did a brief stint at NASA Johnson in nineteen ninety seven. I worked on um, uh, design projects related to the space shuttle and the Russian space station Mir. Their collaboration. So we used to call them the shuttle Mir projects. Uh, while I was at NASA, I also trained for parabolic flights. Uh, I was a test subject for many, very many ongoing tests. And I also looked or I analyzed four of the shuttle Mir missions, you know, where the American space shuttle Atlantis would dock with the Mir space station, the Russian space station. And one of the American astronauts would then go on to spend four to six months on the Mir space station as part of the mm -hmm. cooperation. And my, one of my, there were two or three different projects, but this one was my favorite, where I looked at astronaut responses. Uh, the American astronauts who were on Mir for a couple of months at a time, like four to six months, and mm -hmm. the short duration American astronauts who experienced a Russian space station 
for a brief period of five to seven days while the shuttle was docked to Mir, right? And I had to analyze the, uh, the, these two responses um, along, you know, food, uh, odor, sleep, air quality, um, internal layout of the space station. So it was, it was fascinating to see the responses of short duration astronauts versus long duration astronauts. Hmm. And I'm hoping to, I'm in fact, I'm talking to a graphic novelist friend of mine to see if we can make an interesting graphic novel out of that project because there's some very interesting uh, little stories that we can use for the graphic novel, you know, that, that particular project of mine. All right. Th that was part of Moonfront, right? No, no, that was NASA. No. And then I started uh, working for Boeing in 98. It took 15 months from the day I was interviewed by this company called McDonnell Douglas, which was uh, in Southern California. Mm. Um, and by the time I started working for them, it was acquired by Boeing. So I ended up working for Boeing. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. tough for a foreign national to be, it's impossible actually for a foreign mm -hmm. national to work in a foreign uh, aerospace company or space agent, uh, agency unless you have the citizenship of that country. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Boeing actually hired me and took the trouble 14, 15 months to get all the clearances was amazing. Um, and I was Absolutely. pretty much the only foreign national on a site where they make Delta rockets. So I'll write a book about it someday, how that happened and, and all that. But anyway, you so, should, yeah. Yeah, so I worked in, uh, with Boeing for three years on the space station program. And because I was a foreign national, I didn't work on design projects because I didn't have access to the internet, but I worked on international business development. So I think that gave me a chance to understand how the aerospace sector works from a business perspective, which I thought was a great opportunity for me. And after three years with Boeing, I decided to move on and start my first little company, a partnership in, in San Francisco, and it was called Moonfront. Uh, so Moonfront, I was 29 when I started it, and the word startup didn't quite exist. <laughs> and we were six partners, and we all pursued projects uh, that were all space-related, but uh, that interested us. For, for example, in my case, I would uh, take on projects related to exploration. And uh, while I was in San Francisco, I started a second company in Vienna, in Austria. And this was in 2004. The company was called Liquifer, or is called Liquifer. Uh, it, we celebrated our 15th anniversary last year. Oh, congratulations. And uh, the idea behind the Vienna company was that we wanted to show the NASA's and the European space agencies of the world that there is a better way to design habitation systems, exploration systems for human missions. What I mean by that is the uh, traditional space agencies like the NASA's, they always have been taking an engineering centric approach to design. Um, they even, even to this day, they don't have openings for architects or industrial designers, for example. Mm. So with the Vienna company, we wanted to show that we need to move away from the engineering centric approach to uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, to designing these systems. So initially when we got started, uh, people thought that we would be a great company to make fantastic compute, computer renderings, you know, of future habitats and uh, it would be good for PR. But they were surprised to find that not only could we do detailed design of rovers, habitats, spacesuits, suit boats, we could actually build prototypes. And uh, so that was my second company. Um, and then I moved back to India in 2008 and I launched my third venture, which was called Earth to Orbit. Um, the first seven years we spent, so, so essentially when I moved back, I looked around and because I grew up with ISRO, with the Indian Space Research Organization, my dad being part of ISRO uh, since its initial days, I, I was trying to figure out what is it that I want to do for India, in India, through my new venture. I was very clear that I did not want to work for a big space agency or big company um, because the reason I even left Boeing was if you work for one of those uh, mega corporations or mega space agencies, you cannot speak your mind. Um, so it is important mm -hmm. to be outside of that environment to challenge the status quo, to change the status quo, right? 
which I find exciting. So I decided I'll start another company and I first went to Trivandrum to meet the team that's working on the Indian Human Space Program. Uh, for those of you listening to this podcast, uh, ISRO has been working on an Indian Human Space Program for, I would say, uh, easily more than a decade now. Uh, we have tested two crew capsules uh, for re-entry technologies. We have tested a scaled version of the Space Shuttle uh, in May of 2016, and we are calling it the RLV, Reusable Launch Vehicle. We are planning a residential astronaut training facility in the outskirts of Bangalore. Uh, so what I did is I went and met this team of at ISRO, one of the centers in Trivandrum, and I also exchanged some of the projects that we had been doing through my Vienna company, you know, for human space exploration, mm -hmm. which was a good exchange. But like I said, I didn't want to work for the agency. So I thought, what is the challenge that I should take on as my first after moving back to India? And I looked at the rockets we have. One is the PSLV, the other one is the GSLV. Um, so any launch capable nation, there are seven launch capable nations in the world, so just a handful, typically has two rockets. One that is used to launch Earth observation satellites, the other that is used to launch communication satellites. Mm -hmm. So the Earth observation satellites usually fly in a sun synchronous orbit over the poles at about 600, 700 kilometers from the Earth. And these are elliptical polar orbits and the communication satellites fly way high around 36,000 uh, kilometers from the earth over the equator in circular orbits. So anyway, I think I was smitten. I was smitten by the PSLV, the, the, uh, the, the rocket, and I looked up the history of the PSLV. It first flew in 93. I came back to India in 2008. So I was, I thought to myself, how do I make the PSLV, one of the most sought after rockets in its class internationally. See, mm. India has an amazingly accomplished government space program, but we are yet to play a respectable role um, in the international space market. The international space market as of today, uh, and I'm talking about the civilian space market, not, mm. the, not the defense side, uh, is, is getting close to around 400 billion with a B dollars a mm. year and India is not yet a significant member of that market right so I thought I want to put India into on the international map as in make it internationally sought after and competitive so the PSLV became that instrument to proving that um, and I had one of my initial interns look at all the foreign launches that we had done on the PSLV starting 99 until 2008 and we found that we had launched about 1,500 kilograms of foreign payloads in those 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the challenge I had was, um, and, and most of the European uh, clients who would launch on the PSLV would directly approach ISRO through their diplomatic uh, you know, embassies and stuff because we have good bilateral relations with Europe. But if PSLV had to be a world leader, we had to break into the US market, very important. It's the largest launch market. And the other country that I wanted to uh, also bring to the PSLV was Japan. Mm -hmm. So we launched uh, our first Japanese satellite or a satellite from a Japanese client on the PSLV in 2012. Typically from the day you find a launch client or a launch client comes to you, it takes about four years or five to actually launch their satellite. It's wow. complex, it's pretty complex. There are regulatory issues, technical issues, communication issues. Um, and then the US market was closed for India, uh, primarily mm -hmm. because of a 1998 embargo, US embargo, uh, which by the way still exists. Uh, the US put an embargo on India in 98 when we conducted nuclear tests. Um, I mean, the US likes to play the big brother, right? The moral police. <laughs> Yeah, And the embargo still exists. So that was the first big hurdle because under the embargo, American companies are not allowed to sell space components to ISRO. So if you can't sell space components, launching an American satellite on a foreign rocket, in this case an Indian rocket, was out of question. Hmm. And remember, rockets are the equivalent of missiles and everything in aerospace is dual purpose in, in a way. It's a very sensitive hmm. technology. Anyway, so that was the first hurdle, the embargo. Second hurdle was an export control regime called ITAR, I-T-A-R, 
which was written in the during the Cold War era in the 60s, you know, when USSR and the US were competing and there was a space race and so on. So this export control regime is fairly stringent and hasn't been reformed much since the 60s. And what it does is, so even if let's say a pencil is made in the United States and it needs to fly on a foreign rocket, it becomes a defense article. And you need all kinds of clearances um, for it to actually fly on a foreign rocket. So that was the other big hurdle. The third hurdle was, of course, the intense lobbying in Washington, D.C. by big companies, big space companies, uh, to prevent business from leaving the country. Right. So these were our three hurdles. And for the first time, uh, I had an opportunity to do what I call soft diplomacy. So over three years, my, our first launch client was a company from Stanford, a Stanford startup called Skybox Imaging. Mm -hmm. And Skybox, in, in, by the way, is the first space startup in the world to have raised private capital in the valley. You know, before that, none of the space startups would get money from venture capitalists and stuff. They would all get it through grants from NASA or contracts, you know, the European Space Agency and so on. Right. Even Elon Musk gets his billions from NASA and the Department of Defense, just, just as an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, Skybox became our client. They were a startup. We were a startup. We decided, hey, let's give it a shot. And they hired a fairly competent, expensive ITAR lawyer to deal with the ITAR issue. And I personally went and met uh, diplomats both in Washington, D.C. and Delhi over three years. Um, I must have met more than a dozen diplomats totally on both sides. So, so we can call you a space diplomat as well. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And I think I think it took us three years, but eventually the U.S. State Department did give us the permission after three years to launch Skybox's uh, satellite on the PSLV. It took us another year to get all the signatures on both sides because you know you have bureaucracy everywhere. And another year to get a launch agreement in place between uh, Antrix, which is ISRO's marketing arm, and uh, mm. my client. And by the time we launched, which was yet another year, uh, Skybox was acquired by Google. So we ended up launching a Google satellite, a 110 kilo yeah. Google satellite on the PSLV. And I like to point out that when you hear that the PSLV has uh, created a world record by launching 104 satellites in a single launch, which, mm. by the way, is staggering, right, in terms of technological capability to be able to launch and put in orbit uh, with amazing precision, 104 birds, you know, uh, is, is, is something that only a handful of space agencies in the world can do. That's stunning. And out of the 104, if I may say, 96 are American satellites. Uh, small mm. CubeSats and stuff. But that wouldn't have happened had I not spent my six years opening up and building a bridge uh, between the countries and making it possible. Mm. So that's what Earth 2 Orbit did the first seven years. And uh, for three years, we worked. Um, I started to worry about climate change. And um, I mean, I would, I would say that we, in some ways, we have passed more than one tipping point. We mm. are talking about anthropogenic climate change as if the worst is yet to happen. But I think the worst is already happening. If you look at the bushfires in Australia, if you look at uh, the earthquakes, the frequency of earthquakes and intensity of earthquakes, uh, if you look at uh, the cyclones and hurricanes around the world, um, we have now gotten to a point where instead of using the word climate change, we should use the words climate collapse. And mm -hmm. I would like to also say that if we do not, I, I think reversing it is going to be very tough anyways. But I think uh, people often like to think that the Earth is very fragile. You know, that's what Yuri Gagarin said and, and other astronauts have said when they look mm -hmm. at our blue planet from space. Uh, and we have, uh, we had an exploration conference in Bangalore last year. And uh, one of my favorite astronauts, a retired French astronaut, uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy was in Bangalore. And I remember Jean-Francois saying something very beautiful. He said, the Earth is not fragile. It will go on. It is we, the Homo sapiens, who are fragile and we might perish. So mm. I think that's sort of the message that I want all the young listeners on the program uh, to take away with them. Um, and I think that will create 
the kind of climate awareness and thinking um, around how they want to shape the future of their planet. Because I think the adults have failed them already um, mm. in, a, in, a, in very many ways. So I think we need planetary ethics, we need climate consciousness, and um, I think the millennials and the Gen Zs have a very big role to play on that front. All right. I, I do want to come back to climate change and spend some time there as well. You were earlier talking about uh, these rocket experiments, and that's something that just caught my mind. I don't know how many of us do know that uh, the Indian uh, experiment with rockets actually happened in 1963, right? Yes, indeed. Indeed. The first experimental rocket was launched from Thumba uh, in Kerala in 1963, and not very many people know about it. So, you know, in international fora, when people use the words, uh, the word emerging, uh, space programs and they they quote India or China I'm I'm on one hand amused and on the other hand you just shake your head with the kind of ignorance uh, that mm. there is out in the world in fact the Indian and the Chinese space programs are two of the oldest uh, right and and sort of the western and the northern hemisphere are so enamored with their programs they don't quite realize that um, we are not an emerging space nation at all. We, we launched our first little rocket in 1963. And, mm. and we can do things that, uh, both in terms of technological capabilities and budget, I would easily place India in the top six in the world. You mentioned about the Mir uh, project where the Americans and the Russians were collaborating. But I guess Americans and Russians would have had different approaches to space exploration. And would that have been obvious during these joint missions as to how each country wanted to approach space? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Most certainly. That's, a, that's actually a wonderful question. Um, the Russians' approach to human space flight and the American approach to uh, human space flight are distinct in very many ways. In fact, one of the talks that I like to give from time to time is I use two slide projectors and two sets of slides. And I walk people through, say, um, you know, s living on the space shuttle versus living on the Russian space station Mir. And mm. then I show them that not only are there differences or contrasting approaches to the technology, there are also contrasting approaches to how they actually live in low Earth orbit. Right? That's interesting. And um, I feel the Russians take a very natural, a very organic approach to living um, around in you know in, in earth orbit in the sense that they don't make a big deal of it um, mm. i remember when um there was um there were a couple of accidents on me towards the end of its life in the sense me was already 15 years old when um, the americans kind of pressurized the russians to get rid of it because the russians had to then put in money into the international space station program and I was in Houston, I remember, and there was a fire that broke out on me when Jerry Lininger, the American astronaut, happened to be on board. And I remember reading in one of the Houston newspapers saying, we need to get involved, Jerry is up there, that kind of message. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, here we are, sort of doing international cooperation, and we are not even mentioning uh, the names of, you know, Jerry's uh, sort of co-astronauts who are also on me during the when the fire mm. breaks out. So when such a thing happens, you always see the Western media make such a hue and cry about it. But if you look at the Russians, they take it in the stride. They solve the problem. I mean, if you look at the International Space Station that's currently orbiting the Earth, you know, where we have 16 partner nations that have built it and are operating it and are visiting the space station. Mm. Uh, we've had problems there too. You know, we recently had to dodge yet another space debris. We have had problems with leakage, uh, you know, depressurization that needs to be. So the two biggest uh, threats or the two biggest uh, situations that one can uh, face while being or living in orbit is one, when your space habitat experiences a leak and it gets depressurized. It can even happen on a jetliner if you're flying and there's a leak. Mm. The other one is a fire. So what I'm trying to say is um, the way uh, 
the Americans approach space, they would like you to believe that they do everything fabulously and everything is watertight and safe. Uh, but if you look at the space shuttle and the two disasters we've had, you know, the Challenger disaster in 86 and then the Columbia disaster in 2003, most people don't know that the space station wasn't designed originally to fly human beings in the first place. It did not have an ejection capsule. So um, it was designed, it was called the Space Transportation System or the STS. It was meant to fly cargo and satellites and so on. So in my view, the space shuttle was a very dangerous way to fly humans or ferry humans to the space station or to space. But you will never hear the Americans talk about it that way, right? Mm. So I think um, I also find that the Russians, um, they, they think of living in Earth orbit as a natural extension of life on Earth in some ways, mm. uh, which I think is a philosophy I myself subscribe to. I think we cannot draw a line between Earth and space because we are currently living on a spaceship that's hurtling through space at enormous speeds. We forget, right? Uh, and living in space is just an extension of our cosmic existence on this particular planet. So I like mm. philosophically, I think I'm more aligned to that kind of thinking. Um, that we are already on a spaceship and we are designing to live um, in planetary destinations or spaceships, you know, off the planet. Right. And since you're very involved in designing these futuristic or, or near future uh, habitable capsules. Uh, I think a, a, a lot of our listeners would be would find this part very interesting. If you could just give us a little bit. First of all, if I would have to ask you and you had to choose, uh, at the moment everyone's talking about uh, Mars or Moon. Mm -hmm. What would what would from what all from everything that you know and what would be the destination to start with? Would it be the moon if we had to move out or would it be Mars? Oh, most certainly the moon. Most certainly the moon. The moon is our nearest neighbor. Uh, if you have a heavy lifter rocket, you can get there in just about two days or three days. Uh, getting to Mars takes a good six months and the launch window to launch to Mars comes every 26 months, so every two years or so. Mm. So I think the moon is a natural first step. And I'd, I've never... I don't believe uh, it is an either or situation. I think the moon is, uh, should be our first stopover and then we should think about getting to Mars um, mm. for very many reasons. I think the moon can serve as a test bed for some of the technologies that we would need on faraway planets and Mars in my view is far away. It's not as close as the moon. Uh, mm. The moon also has um, um, I think the, the romantic side or sort of, of being a poetic side of being on the moon is if you are if you're on the near side, you could actually see your own home planet, you know, sort of rise and set every day, just like you see a sunrise and a sunset on Earth. Mm -hmm. On moon, you can actually see the Earth rise and Earth set. So those Keeps you anchored. See, oh, yes, anchored and psychologically uh, sort of connected to your home planet. Uh, those of you who are listening to this podcast should go and Google Kaguya, which is a Japanese mission, um, and look at the Earth rise uh, that was shot in high definition during the Kaguya mission, and you'll know exactly what I mean. So I think the moon is definitely the first step, and the Mars will happen. And I think in, the, in this decade, I believe we will see human presence on the moon. Great. And if you had to, we'll come back to the spaces, but could you give us a little bit of interesting facts on, I think, uh, for, for the moon base, you are also in, uh, involved with the hybrid moon base uh, habitat. And, and what is that like? What are you all actually doing with yeah, this so, hybrid um, moon base? Over, over time, um, I have had the chance to work with, I mean, these are not solo projects. These are always team projects, right? Hmm. So through my Vienna company and through some of the workshops that I have coached and initiated during the last couple of decades, we have looked at uh, lunar habitats, right? And there are, um, so the, the architecture that we use for designing and building space habitats in outer space, whether it is on a surface of a planetary body or in, out, in Earth orbit, we call it piecemeal architecture, where you take certain components of the habitat uh, through multiple rocket launches and you have them dock and sort of imagine it's sort of a Lego puzzle, you know, where you put together these different building blocks and create a space station or a, 
uh, space habitat. So for the moon, we have been looking at uh, using piecemeal architecture and building habitats which solid parts that we carry from Earth to the moon. We've also been looking at using inflatable parts. So certain parts which you take on the top of a rocket and once you get to the surface of your planetary destination, you actually expand it. So volumetrically, you have more space to live in, to work in. And you attach that to the existing components that are there. And then you rigidize it. So you inflate it, you rigidize it. And one of the scenarios that we have looked at in the past is a hybrid habitat where you have solid components and also inflatable components. The more recent research that's happening, which I find very exciting, is how can we use 3D printing uh, mm. to build on Moon, on Mars, where we take in situ uh, regoliths, the soil that is available to us, and use that as our building material and use 3D printing processes to build parts for the habitat. So that way we won't have to carry everything from Earth. So we are currently in the, in the very, very early stages. So we are in the lab phase, as I would call it, where we are trying to build small bits and pieces, like you could imagine a tile of sorts, using simulated rural regolith and using lava casting and sintering techniques, uh, which you know eventually this experimentation will lead to proper 3D printed um, of you know, parts of our habitats. Mm -hmm. So considering the, uh, I guess the lunar dust would be quite an issue because it's not what we see on, on film or on movies normally where an astronaut goes out in a white suit and comes back with a white suit. I guess it's more <laughs> in industrial. Uh, yeah, because yes, yes. No, no, you're absolutely right. Dust is a major issue. In fact, uh, it's treacherous, if you ask me. So mm. the two big challenges for us humans to live on the moon would be radiation and dust. Let me explain. So the moon has no atmosphere, no running water. So mm. the lunar dust is very, very fine as in size. It's, it's very small, very fine and very sharp like glass. Okay. Uh, if, you if you go to the beach here on Earth and pick up a grain of sand and look at it, it's rounded because there are weathering forces and it's sort of over time, it's rounded, right? A, a, a grain of sand, mm. if you look at it. That's not possible on the moon because there's no wind, no running water. So all of the lunar dust is very sharp and it also has electrostatic properties such that it adheres to the uh, surface of your spacesuit, your, the mechanical parts of your rover, and if you breathe it and bring it into your habitat with your spacesuit and all, then you actually breathe it in and it goes and sits in your lungs. And we don't even know what the long-term effects might be, uh, having, having jaggedy, sharp dust. And I've also heard from astronauts um, that it gets into the hermetic ceiling of your uh, gloves, of your spacesuit gloves, for example. Just imagine that. That's uh, stunning. There is an amazing photograph of astronaut Eugene Cernan who was on the last Apollo mission, uh, 1972. So if you Google Eugene Cernan, Apollo 1972, one of the photographs, he looks like a coal miner. You know, he looks, he, because he's been out mm -hmm. on what we call uh, long duration lunar sorties, which means walking around on the lunar surface, exploring, doing geolog taking geological samples for several hours. And his space suit is just coated with this, lunar dust and he looks like a coal miner quite literally in that photograph and that mm -hmm. should give you an idea of how treacherous that dust is so we are also as designers looking at designing suit ports such that when the astronaut comes back to base or comes back to the habitat after a exploratory walk around or uh, even on a buggy or a rover he or she should should leave the spacesuit outside and be able to wiggle back into the habitat from the, the back. Uh, this should be sort of this, you know, the Russian spacesuit has it too. It's like a door like thing where you open the back of your spacesuit and wiggle back into your habitat. That's one option. That, that, that sounds so Iron Man. Oh, yes, it does. And the other option would be to actually have dust showers, uh, which um, again, you know, all of this needs research and prototyping and testing. Uh, let's also talk briefly about radiation. So radiation, you know, you have no atmosphere. On Earth, we forget that not only do we have this um, 
blanket that we call the atmosphere, we also have two radiation belts called the Van Allen radiation belts mm. which protect us from the galactic radiation. And on Moon, you have neither of these. So you are totally exposed. And um, unless we are able to build radiation protection, and currently there are only two ways that are known to us in order to create radiation protection for our habitats. One is using lunar regolith, build thick walls like bunkers, you know, uh, on Earth we build these bunkers for mm -hmm. war and stuff like that. Or use, create walls filled with water. Mm -hmm. uh, or choose to build a lunar habitat inside, say, a lava tube. So you go subterranean and you protect yourself. So radiation and dust are really going to be two amazing challenges, both for designers, for the astronauts who actually choose to live there. And because of these two challenges, uh, Joachim, if you ask me in the long term, I don't see humans uh, spending uh, long, long periods on the moon themselves. They will visit. Um, but if and as and when, which I'm sure humanity will get into mining and construction on the moon, uh, it will really be construction workers, miners, probably even bioengineered humans who will be living there and taking on treacherous duties, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. And when you actually conceptualize all these designs and you're talking about these particular habitats which uh, uh, have to artificially now be inserted into nature, mm -hmm. uh, Susmita, how much of inspiration do you take from nature? Because if you look around, there is a lot of very interesting stuff that is already available that we could replicate or duplicate. But do you do you all consider what is around? Oh, very much so. It's called biomimetics or biomimicry. And we often look to uh, inspirations in nature when we design our habitats and other things. For example, my Vienna company designed uh, something called She, which is... Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, a, it's a habitat which was designed for a crew of two uh, and the way it was designed is it actually folds. So, you know, we, have, we look at all kinds of things, whether we are looking at uh, the geometry of a pineapple or we are looking at how a jellyfish propels itself or we are looking at how a spider translates or moves um, or we are looking at, uh, mm. you know, how certain flowers, uh, the way they open and close, aperture-like. Um, so, so yes, we look at these natural forms and we do adopt slash adapt them into our designs. Because I think there isn't any better teacher than nature, if you ask me. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we do mimic nature. And there is always, we look for uh, all kinds of inspiration, especially in the brainstorming phase, you know, when we are ideating and coming up with concepts. We do. All right. Right. And these prototypes, which uh, you earlier mentioned, are very important because besides the designing, you build it. Mm -hmm. How do you guys test these, uh, whether it's communication, do you go underwater? Because I guess communication would be one part of it, but the feasibility uh, for testing such stuff could only be done underwater or do you also use other techniques to uh, test these prototypes? Yes, it's very, very important Joachim, to test everything we design and build. Uh, so we often use what we call analogs uh, for mm -hmm. testing. For example, if we have designed a spacesuit for lunar exploration, uh, one of the ways we do it is we uh, create or simulate uh, sort of not exactly one six gravity, but lower gravity by going underwater and, and test the spacesuit with the rover and the protocols underwater in a, in a tank, in a water tank. Uh, we also sometimes do it uh, on the surface. You know, for example, if we have designed something for Mars exploration, we will take that habitat to a site where we think the terrain and the geological features are like Mars. For example, in Spain, there is a place called Rio Tinto. And we, my Vienna company has uh, uh, been part of simulations in Rio Tinto where a space habitat um, and, a, and a space suit prototype and a rover prototype for that matter were taken and we simulated a sort of mock Mars mission so to speak to test whether the habitat deploys the way it is meant to when it arrives on the surface of Mars whether you can actually spend time in there uh, you know a crew of two or whatever it is designed for 
and carry out exploratory activities around your habitat using the rover, the spacesuit, the other instruments, and also protocols. You know, there are certain communication protocols that we develop for astronauts to work with each other and also with uh, mission control, with uh, robotic assistance, and so on. Mm -hmm. And through this time, a very important part would also be, I guess, one is the application of the suits or, or the equipment. And what about the person actually traveling through this mission or wearing the suit? Because I guess uh, we've mentioned the movie Solaris, for example. Mm -hmm. There is an impact on the mind because traveling through space where oh, yes. nobody has actually done it. How is that addressed? Or is that part of what you all do? Or then you hand it over to probably a psychologist or somebody else is looking at that? That, no, that's a, that's a very good question. In fact, for the longest time, um, you, some of the space agencies were not comfortable talking about psychological problems, right? Uh, in fact, uh, now, it's, now things are more open, nothing is taboo, you can talk about these things more openly. And Solaris is, happens to be one of my favorite films because it does okay. bring out, I mean, uh, which other film talks about psychology the way Solaris does, you know, because it's Absolutely. a mind. And, and I think... Um, uh, the way, like I, I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, that uh, me and my friends who are in this business of uh, space architecture, we the reason we take a multidisciplinary approach, uh, Joachim, is so that we can also have sociologists and psychologists and color theorists and ergonomists be part of the design process. And I cannot emphasize enough that psychological stressors are as important in some cases more important than physiological stressors you know the stresses that the human body and mind experience when they are in outer space for long periods of time mm. because if you are unable to design um, habitats and such which um, you know you have to ensure several things psychologically speaking you have to ensure crew cohesion so that the crew doesn't start fighting among themselves they don't fall apart right that's one psychologically speaking. The other one is how do you retain the interest of your um, traveler, of your astronaut in the habitat for long periods of time? Because remember, you are like living in a hermetically sealed can or tube and you can't just walk away if there's a fight or if you are so bored because boredom sets in a couple of weeks after you are up there. right? Mm -hmm. And psychologically, you also need support from mission control from time to time to help you overcome some of the things that might be bothering you. Uh, or let's say you are doing a spacewalk outside the space station, right? And even though you have practiced the spacewalk hundreds of times in a neutral buoyancy tank on Earth, when you are in outer space and you step outside your module, you're literally in pitch darkness looking at sort of the blue planet down below. And you feel, you know, I have known astronauts who have panicked and who are saying to mission control or their compatriots on board that I'm falling, I'm falling, I'm falling, you know, so the panic sets in. So how do you help that astronaut regain control in the sense mental control and not uh, panic and go on and do what he or she is meant to do outside the space station in a space suit, doing a spacewalk and all that, right? So I think, I think the psychological bit um, is now being addressed more openly because earlier everybody wanted to send out a message during the mercury you know project mercury and all of during the space race so to speak mm -hmm. that these are all macho men uh, sort of air force pilots who can do it and they are yeah. above all human frailties you know they are super tough and all that but no i think in in outer space you do fall in love you do fight you do have psychological issues, and I think designers play a big role in mm -hmm. designing habitats for better habitability, you know, taking into account human factors, and this is one of the human factors that we are talking right. about. Right, and I, yes, and I think we can all identify with it because of just the solitude of it with, uh, with what uh, everyone is going through now with the corona lockdown, just staying in a room and still staying in a room with your family, yes. somebody that has lived with you all your life, and you get all these incidents and, and, and people breaking out. So can you imagine living with somebody you, you've never met before? I don't uh -huh. mean literally never met before. Yes, yes. No, I think that's a great parallel. That's, that's a fantastic parallel. I think you're absolutely right. When you're thrown into a certain volume, 
with a handful of people, whether you know them or you don't know them. You know, in, in, so I run a, a collective called the City as a Spaceship Collective, mm -hmm. where we look at the reciprocities between living here on Earth and living in outer space, because there are many. And what you just cited as an example is a great reciprocal uh, behavioral thing that we experience right here on Earth. And we also experience it in space. Uh, take any extreme city, uh, Joaquin, because take Mumbai. You've grown up in Mumbai, for example. Um, or take Tokyo or Sao Paulo or New York, which are very, very dense cities, or Hong Kong. And people often live, the human density is so high that the challenges of living in these uber dense cities is somewhat similar to living in small, compact, confined environments in outer space. Mm. So I really like the parallel you drew with the pandemic confining us to smaller volumes with the same people every day. And yes, so I think that's a very good uh, training, in fact, if you ask me <laughs> to have to spend time in outer space uh, locked up with a bunch of people. And also you have to, you know, you, you can't just uh, like even here during the pandemic, you're not just living, uh, doing house chores, working trying to be do leisurely things it's all very similar the challenges are very similar if you ask me to go through a day mm -hmm. locked up so so smita as we've been talking we we do know now from from the latest uh, figures that are coming out there are approximately uh, 21000 traceable uh, space debris objects in in low earth orbit well they're saying 34000 yeah 34000 traceable which is 10 centimeters or or bigger and 128 million odd <laughs> objects which are less than 10 centimeters mm. and does this worry you and how important do you think uh, is it going to be for the future where we come up some space law what is your thought on this oh it not only worries me it actually upsets me very great it upsets me greatly and i am now actively involved um, with some of my international friends who are equally concerned about the menace the growing menace of space debris to try and push for enforceable, far-sighted laws uh, to not only mitigate uh, future debris, but also if you look at what's happening today, you know, in terms of constellations. So if you're launching a constellation of say 24 satellites, it is, it is kind of acceptable and we understand. But if you're launching thousands of satellites or even tens of thousands, Elon Musk is planning a constellation with uh, 42,000 satellites. Um, not only is debris a big problem there, uh, because satellites which usually fly in low Earth orbit, their lifetimes are quite short, uh, maybe a year and a half, two years, two and a half. You need to keep replacing them, and you need to make sure that the dead satellites need to be uh, sort of deorbited through a controlled deorbiting and burn to, to, to get rid of the debris, right? Um, mm. The other, so one is the debris menace. The second problem with these super, super large constellations is they will most certainly interfere with ground based astronomy the way we know it. And the third problem is um, I think these mega constellations are, in my view, quote unquote, colonizing low Earth orbit already. It's, it's a kind of a land grab. If you put mm. more than 40,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, you're grabbing that shared resource that humanity has for a private enterprise, right? And there is no international body. So the, the International Telecom Union will assign you, approve of certain frequencies that you want to use, certain orbital slots that you want to use. But it is not in any way um, uh, empowered to address the debris menace, right? And the only laws we have so far are uh, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and the 1979 Moon Agreement. And both of them are written in a manner that they are more what you would call altruistic guidelines rather mm. than enforceable laws which ensure, uh, you know, deorbiting debris, uh, regulatory oversight. Um, so I think, I think the debris problem has reached a stage which is uh, as critical and as dangerous as climate change has on Earth. I mean, imagine 34,000 trackable objects. So each object is moving at enormous speeds in, in low Earth orbit. It is moving at around 
17,000 miles per hour or 28,000 kilometers per hour. So even a small thing like an aspirin tablet, say, can hit um, a satellite, a solar panel, what have you, and create very many more debris objects. And those can then create further uh, debris uh, clouds. So we haven't had a catastrophic chain reaction yet, but we can have one any day. So the movie mm. Gravity, in that sense, um, it's, uh, it's sort of a little, um, some, some people might find it exaggerated, but I do think it drives home the point of a catastrophic chain reaction with space debris. And it can happen any day, to be honest. Mm. And we see it happening, I mean, for us to wait for it to happen in space, we just need to step back and look at what we are doing here, because 96% of all mammals left are us, and that is frightening. <laughs> yes, yes, no, absolutely. I grew up, grew up on a, a healthy dose of documentaries by David Attenborough, and you can see his latest documentaries, uh, the Planet 2 series on BBC. And mm. you're absolutely right. So 70% of all birds are poultry. Uh, we have destroyed, uh, you know, we only have 35% of wildlife left on Earth because it's all been taken over by Homo sapiens, which is us. Uh, the mm -hmm. planet can sustain, some people say, around uh, one and a half, two billion people, as in humans. And we are already inching close to eight billion people. Um, so, yes, I think, I think it's very, very similar. What we are doing, we are trashing outer space for now, near Earth space, later on probably other planets. And we have done it much the same way we have trashed our home planet. And the people who are creating the debris are not are actually the ones pushing back and not willing to put in enough money and effort into cleaning it up, just like it's on Earth. It's a very similar problem, if you ask me. Mm. And if you had to speak to a lot of the students listening in now, what would your message be to them? Is there any initiate? One is, what is your message going to be? The second is, is there any initiatives that you would want to start or you're starting and you would want people to join in? I think uh, all our listeners would be uh, wanting to know more about that. So I have um, a bunch of messages for uh, young people and students listening to the podcast. Uh, the first one would be, when you dream of ideas, you need to dream with open eyes. Uh, coming up with an idea is usually the easy part. To follow through and transform that idea into a reality, whether you are designing or building a product or whether you are creating a new organization, a new movement, it all takes uh, patience, tenacity, perseverance. So don't give up. And it usually takes a good five, seven years to make that idea happen. The other thing I would uh, encourage young people to do is get out of your comfort zone. I, I feel the millennials and Gen Zs um, are very fortunate in, in many ways in the sense that they have access to a lot more information. Uh, they have great access to communication tools. Um, so they are an empowered generation. But they also happen to be an entitled generation. right? So I think I always tell young people, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, and do something where you stretch your capacities. You, you test yourself. Uh, don't have your mom and dad and uncle and aunt and everyone sort of kind of cocoon you and protect you. Um, so take risk. I even tell young people, it's okay sometimes to just jump off a cliff and grow your wings along the way. And even if you crash land and hurt yourself, you know, you'll figure out how to fix your bruises and get up and get going again. So I think... Um, take risk, um, take the time um, to actually take the ideas you have and make them real. The other thing I like to tell them is um, be exploratory in nature. Try and take um, what Robert Browning would say, roads not taken. Right? A lot of kids these days, uh, when I talk to them, they're all kind of preparing to take entrance exams either here in India or just go abroad and work for a big company. So I tell them that going abroad these days is not a big deal. It's very easy, actually. So if all you want to do is go and work for one of the big companies and live um, somewhere in a suburb, that is very easy. You need to think, uh, you, need to, you need to aim higher. And you need to think beyond utilitarian goals and money-centric goals. 
and push yourselves because I think if you don't do it when you are young, you will not do it in, in later life. So that's uh, sort of uh, my three broad messages that I have for young people. And it's amazing coming from you, from someone who's actually walked the talk where you say that, I guess it's, it's whether do you want to be ambitious or do you want to be aspirational, but in line with what you've just said, could you give us what you did and how you managed your trip to Antarctica? Because you were just talking about taking risks and going to, uh, you've literally gone to the other end of the world. That would be very interesting for us to hear about your trip to Antarctica because... Yes, uh, yes. Let's talk a little bit about... None of us are going to have a chance to do that, but we want to hear what happened there. Yeah, so I think the Antarctica trip, um, so I first went to the Arctic in 2009. I was invited by the Swedish Space Institute in the Swedish Arctic in Kiruna to give a talk. So I was a little surprised and I was thinking, who will my audience be in, in the Arctic, you know? And uh, lo and behold, I show up in the auditorium of the Space Physics Institute and it's a, it's a room full of people. And... Uh, guess who? So not only the researchers who work at the Swedish Research Institute in Kiruna, but also a busload of high school students showed up. Apparently, there's a school in, the Kiru in Kiruna, in the Swedish Arctic. And I asked the students, so how come you chose to come and study in the Arctic? And uh, pretty much most of them, they said, oh, to get away as far from home as possible. So that, that, was, that was the response. Uh, that was in 2009. And then 2017, I was invited by a Russian art commissioner, uh, Alexander Ponomarev, who is an artist. And he used to be a submarine engineer turned, now he's an artist, a very well-known contemporary artist, who had been dreaming of the first cultural expedition to this icy continent. Because most of the expeditions that happen in the context of Antarctica are scientific, normally. Mm. And Alexander Ponomarev had been dreaming of getting a expedition vessel with artists and interdisciplinary experts. Uh, so uh, the way I, uh, I am is I kind of live across disciplines, right? So I would qualify in, in, if you ask Alexander as an interdisciplinary expert. So we were a bunch of um, about 40 artists from around the world who were selected, invited to be part of this expedition and who had come up with artworks that we actually deployed in Antarctica during our landings and then we would bring back the artworks onto our ship and I was one of eight interdisciplinary experts who was part of the crew. We also had a philosopher, we had divers, we had film crew, we had cameramen. So it was a motley group of creative people, largely speaking, um, who made this trip and the way Alexander Ponomarev, he made it possible was uh, the first step he did was, uh, I don't know how many of you listening to this podcast are aware of uh, art biennales. So there are these events in different parts of the world. There's an art biennale that happens biannually in Kochi, in Kerala. There is a very old one that happens in Venice every, every other year. There are uh, other art biennales around the world. And Alexander created what he calls the Antarctic Biennale. And there was a pavilion in Venice uh, and that was step one. And then step two, he had to go out and look for the funding to be able to invite um, artists and us to take this trip to Antarctica. And it's a fascinating trip. Either you can go from Australia or you can go from Argentina. And we set sail from Argentina, from the tip of Argentina, a place called Ushuaia, where it's sort of the end of the world kind of tip. And uh, that afternoon, I remember March 2017, there were two ships that sailed around the same time. And these were sister ships or twin ships. And they were both built in Finland. Um, and I was on one of them. So the first one that sailed went on a, a mammal expedition, you know, a mammal expedition to Antarctica. The mm -hmm. second ship, the twin ship that sailed had us, you know, the creative types and the interdisciplinary types. And um, so the ship was built in Finland. It was owned by Russia and it was operated by a Canadian crew. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. And the first two hours, when you're passing through the Beagle Strait, the waters are calm and it's sort of dusk or sunset times. The colors of the sky are beautiful. 
and then and suddenly yeah the drake I, passage is it is it oh part on, on route yes yes that's what happened so after two years two two hours sorry you hit the drake passage and the reason the drake passage is so violent is if you look at the globe there is no landmass on that latitude right mm. and the 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 oceans are sort of meeting and the winds are whipping your expedition vessel with about 120 on board like a tin can you know just being tossed around for 48 hours um and that is in some ways uh, a very exciting part to uh, sort of the beginning of your journey you are jolted and two-thirds of us were quite sick if you ask me mm. and um so these days uh, you get what we call um motion sickness patch it looks like a nicotine patch but it's it's for motion sickness and you put it on your neck it's a dermal patch so the first day i like many of my um, crewmates were was really sick i could barely leave my cabin i could barely eat anything and then uh, some of us put this patch and what a difference it made you know we could actually walk around of course with vomit bags in our uh, in our pockets but we did make it around uh, the ship. We did make it to the, uh, you know, the the eating meetups. We were able to eat again. And after those two days of Drake passaging, you hit what is called the Antarctic Circle. And suddenly the waters calm down and you are like, it's, it's transformational. And oh. there is Antarctica in front of you. And you... You just cannot prepare to for, for an expedition like this in the sense you cannot you might have seen documentaries, you might have seen mm. great photo photo books, but what you actually see in real life when you arrive, it just uh, is a combination of you know something being very sublime and something at the same time being completely sort of the wilderness, the savagery of the wilderness, it hits you. In a way, I would compare it to the movie Solaris that you mentioned earlier, Joachim, mm. because the landscape in Antarctica is so extreme and the light conditions, because you are literally at the bottom of your planet, right, on, on the globe, uh, light-wise, illumination-wise. And we went there in autumn, so it was March. So the, what I'm trying to say is the light conditions and the landscape are such that I think I would describe the experience as mind-bending. It's, it's nothing that I've experienced. I've traveled a lot. Even the Arctic was, was okay. It was, it was fine. You could get there by land. It was, but Antarctica really felt like being on another planet. And I recorded what I call memory monologues on the trip back. And um, if you were to see some of those short videos I recorded, um, I mean, there are some of my crewmates actually tearing up, talking about, not just their experience, but also the notion of memory, how the human mind works in extreme environments like Antarctica. It's quite revealing. I haven't uploaded the Antarctic uh, memory monologues yet, but I, I hope to someday. And you can see what it does to, to your mind more than anything else, this kind mm -hmm. of an experience. Well, and if you, if you ever do that, please let us know. If there's anything that you want us to put out uh, as far as clips, we can do that as well. And how were the penguins? <laughs> yes, everybody asks about the penguins. So uh, the Antarctic Peninsula where we visited over two weeks, um, we saw two kinds of penguins. One are the gentle gentoos and the mm -hmm. other were, again, these are short penguins. The other variety is the the chin straps. So they have this uh, sort mm -hmm. of a marking around their chins. And one of them is mate specific. So they have the same mate throughout their life. And the mm -hmm. other one is site specific. So you can imagine with climate change setting in, the site specific penguins will have a harder time to survive because the climate is changing. And if, if they're not willing to leave their site, it's going to be problematic. Um, and to be honest, penguin colonies were quite smelly. Um, it was, they were a bit like cattle sheds, I would say. Um, and the vocabulary around penguins is quite hilarious. You know, you have penguin highways, you have penguin cholera, you have penguin poop. Uh, so the penguins definitely are a very important part of the landscape. And they're not as wild as you would want them to be because we were told we are not allowed to approach the penguins. 
and keep our distance. But they were very cosmopolitan, you know. I think they were they are they used to humans now. They just would walk up to us, check out our gear, check us out, check up our artwork. So I think they were really cosmopolitan, the penguins. And the philosopher we had on board, he even had how how do I say a lecture that he gave to the penguins about existentialism, about future, and the penguins were attentively listening to this guy or standing on the rocks, <laughs> conversing to them in Russian. I think it was phenomenal. Uh, oh, wow. the, the penguins, but I think if you ask me, as far as wildlife is concerned, uh, the ones that I was blown away by were the humpback whales. Uh, the humpback whales are these amazingly gentle creatures. You would think that a 40 foot whale weighing 40 tons right next to your inflatable dingy would just, you know, it would be scary, right? Wow, that must have been a sight. Oh, that was. So we were uh, on a couple of our landings, we were surrounded by 30, 40 of these magnificent creatures who were just like, you know, having a good time around our little inflatable boats. Imagine little inflatable rafts with about six, eight people <laughs> sitting on them. And some of them would really come close and open their mouths wide and you could see the baleen, you know, the, the soft teeth they have. Oh, God. They would breach the water with their tails. And it was the first hour was a bit scary, to be honest. And then we were totally with them. And it was amazing how gentle they are, you know, and we think of them as wildlife. I think we humans are wild, if you ask me. Um, mm. So they were with us, hanging out. Uh, we got so used to them that when we eventually went away from the area where we have a lot of these humpbacks, I was starting to miss them. You know, because you wake up in the morning, you look out of your window, your viewport, and there they are. You know. So yeah, I, I think I fell in love with the humpbacks. The penguins were good, but I think the humpbacks were better. And then there were seals, all kinds of seals: crab eater seals, leopard seal. Um, elephant seal. Oh, by the way, we also had a couple of landings which were relevant from a climate perspective, which I think I should share, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. No, please. Uh, one of the landings was um, called Deception Island. So it's a horseshoe-shaped island in Antarctica, uh, and it is a dormant volcano. So you still you can smell the sulfur. The water was warm, and you could swim. But what was striking about Deception Island in Antarctica was you saw these massive silos. You know, think of these as rusted cylinders sitting on that uh, uh, on Deception Island. And there were some expedition huts from way back, you know, the English explorers, the Norwegian explorers. And there must have been volcanic eruptions. And they were kind of the way an expedition hut would be ravaged during an eruption. And it's like a freezer, right? It's so cold out there. So you could see those expedition huts as is, you know, and there would be like an old radio sitting there, an old uh, sort of tin mug, some blanket, mm. uh, frozen in time. So that was one. But to me, the silos were something that resonated because um, apparently back in the day, these explorers, what they had done is they had wiped out the entire seal population in that area and they had taken the blubber, you know, for oil. And they mm -hmm. would store the blubber in those silos. That's what the silos were for. So it gives you a very clear example of that all human exploration eventually leads to exploitation. So the line separating exploration and exploitation is so blurred that the people listening to this podcast need to be very wary and conscious and careful that when they go out exploring, they don't do what these explorers did on Deception Island or what some of our space explorers might do, uh, you know, in terms of mass extraction on Moon or Mars or, or littering near, the, near Earth orbit. So I think exploration, exploitation is a very delicate balance. Oh, what Cortez did. Yeah, and we need to be very wary of it. The other anecdote I would like to share was on one of our landings, uh, this was called Paradise Island, and we decided that we will just sit there for half an hour without saying anything, just in, in, in quiet. And after a few minutes into this uh, sort of a collective uh, sort of practicing of silence in that beautiful landscape, we heard something that came crashing down. It sounded like as if a skyscraper was being detonated, you know, that kind of sound. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is an iceberg was calving. 
you know, the verb is oh God. calving. Yeah. So this iceberg, uh, you could not only hear the sound of the iceberg calving, you could actually see the ice in front of you shuddering and, you know, sort of flaking and falling into the water. So what's happening in Antarctica right now, even Arctic, Greenland, everywhere, um, Himalayas, the Alps, these glaciers are melting, right? When an iceberg calves, it accelerates the melting of glaciers. Mm. And Antarctica is composed of about five to seven large ice shelves. And some of them have already disintegrated. Others are disintegrating. Uh, there was something called Larsen Ice Shelf, not far from where we went. And if you look up Larsen Ice Shelf on the internet, you will see that large parts of it have already gone. Um, in July, which was three or four months after we went to Antarctica, returned from Antarctica, I remember a one trillion ton iceberg calved and broke away from Larsen. Um, so this is just what we, we humans have done to our planet and the repercussions in terms of climate collapse can be visually and acoustically experienced when you go to places like Antarctica or go to the Himalayas or go to the Alps or go to Arctic. I think Arctic will disappear in, in, in the next, uh, within the decade, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. And I think Antarctica, for some reason, for a lot of us, because it's out there and there's no access to it, seems to be out of public perception or public memory. But it was still part of, I think, your hometown in, in uh, Odisha, right? At one time in the, yes. in the past. So they're all part of the same thing. You, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, there was a point on in the history of our planet where we had the supercontinent, right? And mm -hmm. as part of the supercontinent, if you look at the map of India today, so all the way from Odisha to Sri Lanka, that edge of India, of the Indian subcontinent, was actually aligned and hanging out or resting alongside the northeastern edge of Antarctica, what is the northeastern edge today. And over time, when this supercontinent kind of broke apart and moved away, and then, you know, it sort of moved up and we pushed and then we created this Himalayan range as part of it. Uh, so Antarctica has been around for millions of years, and they say that 300 million years ago, it was actually tropical, it was green. Um, and I was born in Katak in Odisha, and near Katak, we have something called the Talcher Mines and the geological deposits, which uh, geologists say has uh, a memory, a memory of that glacial melt that happened 300 million years ago. So I think those of you who are uh, geologists or interested in geology, um, it's, a, it's a great way of learning how your planet has evolved over the years. And yes, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It's very interesting how India was just hanging out with Antarctica and now we are fairly far apart, but absolutely. We are all connected. Mm. I think interconnectedness of our species um, is, is something, again, we need to be conscious about, that we are all connected. Okay, so Smitha, that's really interesting, listening to all that you did at Antarctica. And on a lighter note, I have a question here. While you were passing through the Drake Passage, did the movie Titanic ever come to your mind? I'm sure it did. <laughs> uh, actually, it didn't. It didn't. Um, it did, yeah. No, it did not. But no? I, think, I, I think now that you... <laughs> Um, no, actually, it did not. I mean, yes, I've seen the movie, uh, but Titanic did not come to mind. Uh, but let me let me mention something else which was fascinating during the Drake Passage experience. So one of the artists, mm -hmm. uh, she's a sculptor, a sculptress from Sao Paulo who lives in Brooklyn. She had designed an art installation, Joaquim, which was installed mm -hmm. in the bottom deck of our ship. You know, there were multiple decks and the bottom deck is usually where the housekeeping staff goes and unwinds and it has a lot of the plumbing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, this installation was such that it had four chairs which were uh, hung from a pendulum attached to the, uh, the, the ceiling of the bottom deck in a way that each of the chairs had an independent swinging movement. So wow. even if the ship is being tossed around, if you were to sit on one of these chairs, you would be independent of the movement of the ship. Okay, that's wow. one part. The other interesting part about the art installation was that she had put a CCTV camera on top of the deck, so outside the ship. 
and which was recording live, not even recording, transmitting live the imagery from the external uh, sort of the deck down to the bottom deck where you're sitting on that chair and looking at the scenery, right? This, this stormy weather and all of that. And you could sit on those chairs and look at the horizon in a way, right, from the deck mm. and not feel queasy at all. You wouldn't feel nauseous that you were in your cabin, for example, right? And to me, this art installation is a fantastic one because it is at the intersection of the arts and the sciences. So interesting. And so I, 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 I had to mention it. But no, Titanic, unfortunately, no. James Cameron would be so disappointed. Mm. Um, speaking of which, I think I should mention to the audience that I find James Cameron a fantastic uh, explorer himself because after Titanic, he, he took it, he made it his mission in life to build a submersible which will take him or any human for that matter to 35,000 feet below, below, below the ocean, right? Mm. Um, and remember that humanity has not invested enough in building amazing submersibles, you know, where you can descend to the depths of the ocean and explore the ocean the way we are trying to explore space, for example. So this was mm. a very difficult enterprise and I have seen the documentary the making of this submersible and James Cameron actually being in one of them solo and going mm. down to the very, he started off, I think, with 7,000 feet and then all the way, I think, to 35,000. And this was off, off of Papua New Guinea, where you have that kind of depth that you can go to. And he did it. I mean, here's a, here's a cinema guy. And I met him. I met him in Los Angeles mm. when my company, Moonfront, was part of a collective that hosted uh, and organized or helped organize a party, you know, uh, what we call the Arthur Clark Gala in the Playboy mm. Mansion grounds. So, uh, I mean, mm. people are quite intrigued when I say Playboy Mansion. So we weren't in the mansion, but we were on the, in the grounds surrounding the mansion. Mm. And James Cameron, Tom Hanks, Morgan Freeman, a bunch of these Hollywood uh, film personalities who are interested in space had shown up. And for that particular party, which was, we were celebrating the arrival of the new millennium. We were celebrating the movie 2001 by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke. And we had also uh, beamed Clark live as a 3D hologram from Colombo. Uh, but anyway, I mentioned, because I, I remember James Cameron had also shown up. And uh, so no, no, no Titanic. No Titanic. No Titanic. But, but mentioning, you just mentioned 2001 and... and you had some connection there as well, right? With that oh, yes. film, or with uh, would you with want to Clark, tell us? With Clark, yes. Yeah. So um, um, I have been very fortunate to have had amazing mentors through my journey. Uh, not just in my early years, you know, school and university, but also in my sort of post-university and professional life. And one of them was Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer, uh, who spent... Uh, the latter half of his life in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. He, uh, so I was, I was finishing my uh, master's or my design degree at National Institute of Design. This was 1996. And I, I wanted to raise or find $35,000 to be able to attend the master's program at the International Space University in France. And this was a time when there was no internet. Internet was just starting to happen and very few people, a handful I knew, had access to uh, the internet and had these monochromatic screens where they would, they also even had an email address, which was, you know, uh, a luxury those days. So I would, uh, so I had to raise this money, like I told you, $35,000 over eight months or so mm -hmm. uh, to be able to attend the International Space University. I, I, what I did is a couple of things. One, I approached an uncle of mine who worked for income tax and I said, why don't you give me the list of all foundations in India? And he gave me a list of 70 odd foundations. So I wrote to each one of them, right? Then I approached the United Nations in nine different ways. Um, again, someday I have to write a book about this for you to Whoa. understand. I wrote to seven individuals around the planet, Carl Sagan, uh, Bill Gates, uh, there was this amazing guy with an amazing photo studio in Manhattan in New York called Baldev Dugal. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was Arthur Clarke among them. So I, I sent them a letter 
uh, which remember I used to, I even liked writing letters by hand. And I sent each one of them uh, a synopsis. Sorry, how, how did you get the addresses? Or were you just buying addresses? <laughs> Oh, I, I totally, like I said, you know, back then uh, there was no internet as such, so we would invent addresses. So Arthur Clark, wow. I, I said, Arthur Clark on the on the package, uh, science fiction writer, Colombo, <laughs> Sri Lanka. That's it. Wow. And it made it. You know, same with Bill Gates. I would write Bill Gates, uh, whatever, CEO, Microsoft, Seattle, Washington, USA. That's it. Uh, so I, I interestingly... Um, uh, these seven individuals I wrote to, Baldev Dugal called me and said, I cannot pay for your tuition, Susmita, but I'm happy to give you a job in New York if you want. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. like, wow. Baldev, that has to wait. Uh, I need to first go to the Space University. Then I had Arthur Clark call me up uh, one weekend afternoon when I was actually napping. You know, I like taking afternoon naps. I still do. Even during work days, I take a 30-minute power nap uh, in the middle of my work day. So I was napping. Uh, this is in Ahmedabad, and I get a call from Colombo, and guess who it is? It's Arthur Clark on the other side. Wow. Uh, saying, Susmita, I got your uh, letter and the enclosures. I had sent him not only a handwritten letter, but um, a, a, a printed version of one of my uh, many design projects called the Saucer Concept for Space Habitats. And I'd sent him a synopsis or abstracts of very many different design projects I'd worked on. And he said, oh, I'm glad you want to go to the Space University. How, how much money do you need? And I was, remember, I was napping. So I was a bit, <laughs> so I just threw some number out. You know, I said something like $4,000 because I had done my mental math and I thought, okay, if X many people give me y, y amount, then I will get to my target kind of thing. All right. And I went back to sleep. And the next day I sent him a fax. And I said, uh, you know, you, I was actually sleeping when you caught napping when you, you <laughs> called me and I just blurted out a number. So I, I just kind of partly apologetic message that I didn't know exactly what to say. So then he sent a fax to the university and said, uh, so Susmita has applied to the university. How much do you, does she need for the tuition? You know, I can have it transferred. So the university got jittery. They called me and said, well, Arthur Clark called us. What do you want us to tell him? <laughs> so with this uh, sort of funny sequence of events, Arthur Clark thought, oh, forget it. He just said, uh, he, he gave me a blank check. He essentially said, uh, told the university, let me know how much it is and I'll have it transferred. So I then literally had to sit down and think, how much do I want Arthur Clark to uh, pay for my tuition? So I ended up uh, him having cover all of my tuition except 10,000 euros, which I decided, no, 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 I can't take all of it from him. And that was a loan which I paid back over time. So I wasn't super greedy. Uh, but we became friends after that, you know, me and Arthur Clark. I, I met him in Sri Lanka in 98 after I got a job and had a salary and all that. And we stayed in touch. Uh, when I moved back to India in 2008, the year before that, I wrote to him saying, Arthur, I'm planning to move back. And you know what he wrote back? He said, mm. um, that's strategic, Suspita. I, I was <laughs> like, Arthur, why do you say so? And he said, well, everything began in the East and it's going back there. And then he cited the example of Chinese alchemists having invented gunpowder. Mm. And he said, no gunpowder, no rockets. You know, so this mm. was Arthur Clark for you, 2007. I moved back in 2008 and he passed away in 2009. Uh, but he was amazing. I mean, I could send him an email and I could hear back within a day. Uh, so yes, we, he was a mentor, but also a friend, I would say. What an amazing story. I think this is, I guess if you have an open mindset and you're ready to learn or you're ready to listen or you're looking out, you will find a teacher or a mentor. It's not the other way around. You, you can't go looking for somebody to teach you something that you don't know. So you've got to first be passionate about what you want to know. And I guess then the universe takes care of the mentor, right? Yes, I, I think the message here for young people uh, is that reach out to anyone you want, anywhere in the world. Don't hesitate. Mm. And uh, Susmita, I know that uh, you have uh, limited time. I say limited because we've been uh, <laughs> snatching a lot of your time, uh, more than what we actually planned for. But uh, before we wind down, is there something that you want to talk to everybody listening about your future plans? And is there any way we can get involved with what you're doing? 
Uh, indeed, indeed. Um, so this coming decade, you know, the pandemic also gave me a chance to sit back and reflect as to what is it that I want to do in the coming decade. Um, and there are a bunch of projects. Uh, among them is this project, which I would like to share with your uh, listeners. I would like to create a start, a movement uh, around creating climate consciousness and creating what I call planetary ethics. And this is something I would want to do in partnership with the millennials and the Gen Zs because they are the future. And I'm planning to call this project, We Are All Astronauts. Uh, the reason I've chosen to name it as such is because I want the young people with whom I uh, sort of collaborate to create this movement to realize that they are actually living on a spaceship right this very moment, which they call home, and they need to take care of it. Uh, what I'm planning for this, uh, this endeavor is essentially uh, curating, on one hand, a set of documentaries, uh, you know, from Sagan to David Attenborough. I would like to translate it uh, or subtitle it into all major Indian languages. Uh, you know, we have young people under the age of 25 or 26, some 600 million of them. So even if I can reach 100 million of these young people, uh, it would be fantastic. Uh, the other thing I want to do uh, is curate uh, stories around how people are actually individually, collectively giving back to their planet, nurturing the planet uh, instead of destroying it. Um, and I also want to find a way to uh, not only you know be able to share all the amazing content there is, but also have a live feed every week or every couple of weeks where young people can tune in, ask me questions, have conversations about anything under the sun, like literally anything. So I can be a friend on YouTube or something and have conversations from young, with young people around the world who are, who are trying to navigate and find a way to do things for themselves, for the planet, for the world at large. That's brilliant. I, I think we can all say uh, here at Indian Genes, all our listeners, uh, this platform is absolutely open to we are all astronauts i think we got to start using that tagline now and we will do whatever we can susmita and you please connect with us in any way whether it's through this platform through our podcast through a lot of our listeners and we have a very active group of uh, between the age of 13 to 25 on instagram and that number is growing we do try to put out these posts every day we put out about two or three posts on insta and it's mainly to do with uh, latest discoveries in science or just uh, free thinking but yes we totally committed to we are all astronauts and it's been a uh, absolute pleasure talking to you uh, I have I have to say that I've enjoyed my time I'm sure if I've enjoyed my time and I hope you have so thank you very much for inviting me and yes I will stay in touch and perhaps we can do things together in the future thank you